All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. And a very happy World Ocean Week to all the classrooms who are tuning in today, whether you're in a camera spot, whether you're tuning in live via YouTube, or if you're going to be watching this event later today or throughout the week. We have an amazing series of live events coming up, up this week, celebrating our ocean in partnership with the Explorers Club. I'm going to share a link down here, exploringbytheseat.com backslash Ocean Week. You can find all the events that are coming up. Register to tune in. We'll send you all the links that you need. We can't wait to see your classrooms joining us live this week. So today is a special day. Not only is it the first day of the event, but today is the day that we're celebrating the deep sea. So we started off this morning, first thing with Richard Garriott, president of the Explorers Club. And also he told us about his amazing journey in a submersible to the deepest point of the ocean, Challenger Deep. So if you missed that event, you can check it out later today or anytime this week. Uh, we have a playlist of the world's Ocean Week events uh, coming up on our YouTube channel, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. But we're going to continue our exploration of the deep, talk a little bit about some of the amazing life that we can find, talk about some of the ways it's studied and sampled. So we have Pete Gerges joining us today. He's a professor of uh, organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard University uh, and an adjunct oceanographer in applied ocean physics and engineering at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So his research focuses on microbes that flourish in extreme environments like the deep sea. He and members of his lab also develop new methods and technologies to help answer unanswered questions uh, about these creatures, to study them, to sample them, uh, to explore them in their environment. And we're really lucky today as well to have Andrea Martinez joining us. She's a postdoc in the Gerges lab, and she happens to be live in the lab today, so she's going to show us some really cool stuff as well. So I'm going to bring both uh, in right now. I'm going to bring Andre in to say hello. We'll bring uh, Peter in to say hello. Uh, and then we'll get things rolling. So hey, Andrea, how are you doing today? Hi, how's it going? Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. All right, Andre. Well, it's great to have you joining us live today. Uh, we've got Pete there as well. Pete, are you there? There he hey, is. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? I'm... Um... I'm talking to you live from just outside of Cambridge, Massachusetts. I want to apologize in advance. I got some nasty little non-COVID bug this weekend. At least I hope it's not COVID. So I'm uh, going to be a little mm, and uh, sort of maybe hard to hear, but I'll do my best. I promise. And don't hesitate to ask questions. All right. Excellent. Well, I'm going to let the two of you take over for a bit. I know, Pete, you were planning on a little introduction. Uh, and we're going to kind of go back and forth. A little show and tell. A little... A little picture action. So I'm looking forward to it. We'll let you take over for a little bit. Thank you, Joe. So it is a real pleasure to see you all here. Um, I want to start by um, by talking about this thing called the deep sea. You know, it's it's this part of our planet that humans have always been fascinated by. Um, it appeals to our sense of exploration and wonder. And at the same time, a lot of people don't really kind of know much about the deep sea uh, because it's incredibly difficult for us to get to and to study. <clears throat> what I can tell you, let's start with some, some um, kind of facts, okay? So I want you to think about every place on earth where animals or microbes or people live. Don't think about all of it. That's what we call the biosphere, right? When you think about the biosphere, you know, you might think that, okay, of all the continents there are, maybe 15% is the United States and maybe 20% is Africa and so on. That's kind of sometimes how we look at it. But here's what's really cool. In terms of our planet's total habitable space, <clears throat> places where or, um, organisms live, where animals and microbes live, the deep sea is actually 80% of our planet's living space. Just think about that for a second. That means that <clears throat> if you look at Every place something is alive, you know, um, a rainforest, a tundra, um, Boston, um, Dallas, Los Angeles, just pick it, Paris, wherever you are. You think of all of the things that you know, the nearby forests and all that, all of that fits into 20% of our planet's living space. And the other 80% is deep sea. Now, how do we define deep sea? Well, that's the part of the ocean that's beyond the reach of sunlight. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, 
so for example, when you get down to a thousand meters, which is a little bit about a half a mile, um, there's no sunlight below that. And so the largest habitat on earth is deep dark ocean. And so I've got this long joke I've told forever that if aliens came to visit earth and they wanted to go back and tell their chancellor, their leader, what earth was like, they would tell her that the typical environment on earth is cold, wet, dark, and salty, right? So that's the deep sea. Now, our lab in particular likes to study animals and microbes that live in, in some of the extreme environments in the deep sea, like hydrothermal vents. And today we wanted to give you a little bit of a tour of some of these ecosystems. So first I wanna turn it over to Dr. Andrea and have her um, introduce herself and talk a bit about something she really wants to show you. Dr. Andrea. Hello everyone. Thank you, Pete, um, for that kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you to all of you who are joining us today, this Monday morning. Like Pete mentioned, my name is Dr. Andrea Unsueta Martinez. And um, first I'm gonna introduce myself. So I wanna tell you that I was born and raised in Colombia in a small city of Cali. So the city is located in the middle of Colombia in a valley of the Andes mountain range of South America. My weekends were spent going on hikes in these beautiful tropical forests that were just filled with di a diversity of plants and animals. And I was just, so excited and just wanted to grab and touch everything that moved, all of the animals that I saw. I was so curious about them. So things like really tiny, colorful beetles, all these birds, different kinds of mammals, um, worms, ants, and even teeny tiny frogs that are so small, they're the size of a small, um, the pinky fingernail. So this curiosity for the world around me never left me, but it wasn't until years later after my family and I immigrated to the United States and I was able to go to college here um, that I discovered the studying the world around me um, as a scientist was actually a career option um, and in college at the University of Hawaii I took marine science classes for the very first time and I was introduced to different tropical coastal environments like coral reefs and seagrass beds that reminded me of my native Colombia. And this reignited that curiosity for the natural world, which has fueled um, a career in marine science for me. The ocean is so fascinating and there are just endless opportunities for research. And no matter where you come from, what your background is, what language you speak, there are so many opportunities waiting for you in marine science. All right, so let's dive into the deep. Um, so I believe, Pete, we wanted to start talking about um, hydrothermal vents and just their physical structure. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Correct. So one of the favorite sites um, for research of the Gerges Lab is hydrothermal vents. And these vents are like, imagine um, geysers and hot springs, but they are in the seafloor instead of on land. Um, so when super hot water comes out of the seafloor, um, this hot water holds a whole bunch of different dissolved metals like iron and copper. And when it comes into contact with the really, really, really cold water of the deep sea, these metals start to precipitate out. So they, they come out of the solution um, and they form these crazy structures that look like, like chimneys. Um, what's really cool about these chimneys is that they're basically made out of metal dust and they're held together by all sorts of different chemical processes. Um, and I have a little piece from one of these chimneys that I'm talking about that was collected from the deep sea. I believe Pete collected it. So I'm just going to show you guys. Check it out. So from the outside, it looks really um, brown and just gray looking, but on the inside, check out all that sparkle. It's really sparkly with pyrite, otherwise known as fool's gold. That is really, really cool. 
Um, and I think Andrea, you know, when I first showed you, <coughs> oh goodness, excuse me, folks. When I first showed this to you, you saw the outside, and then I turned it around. You're like, oh my goodness, right? Yes. Um, let me um, let me share a picture because sometimes that these photographs might look a tiny bit better. So let me try this real quick. Okay, how are we looking? You see it? We got it, Pete. Yep. So that's the sample. Thank you, Joe. That's the sample that Andrea held up where we took a picture when we first freshly collected it. And the pyrite was a lot shinier then. <clears throat> Chemically changes over time, but we can actually clean it and make it shiny. But think about this, folks. This is, could you imagine being the person to discover these <coughs> in um, like 1977? I know it seems like a long time ago for many of you, but um, but it really, really, it wasn't that long ago. And scientists had no idea those were there, none. And so when they came across these, their minds were blown. And today, <clears throat> there's an interest in understanding how these sulfides work and how they precipitate metals, because some of these metals are really important to humans. Copper, right? Um, nickel, all of those. So... This is um, understanding how vets work might give us an a better idea of how to get these from the environment more safely in an eco-friendly way. Back to you, Andrea. All righty. Um, I also wanted to share really quick, quick that um, there's a lot of microbes down in these hydrothermal vent environments that can actually make a living off of all of these minerals and metals that are coming out of the sea floor with this hot water. Um, and we're still trying to understand and we investigate a lot how these microbes are able to survive by using these materials to basically breathe. Um, okay, now I'm going to jump to a really cool gadget that the Gerges lab uses to study um, these creatures of the deep. So the Gerges lab has actually pioneered in developing these high pressure vessels. So these vessels are basically like an aquarium, but they are really strong. They are made out of titanium. So even though it looks pretty solid from the outside, on the inside, they are hollow. So this one has a lid, but this can be removed and they're hollow. So we can have deep sea critters in here because with these high pressure vessels, we're able to recreate the high pressures and low temperatures that they are used to um, in the deep sea or high temperatures, depending on. Um, so what you see here is one of these high pressure vessels. Thanks, Dr. Andrea. And, you know, when Dr. Andrea joined the lab, she came to us with a lot of amazing expertise in marine biology, and marine science. And part of what I think uh, drew her to the lab is that we have an environment where we try to welcome people to learn new things and support them in their growth. And, <clears throat> you know, I think some, some of our lab's um, abilities to work in the deep sea are pretty unique. Let me show you one more picture here real quick. All right, here we go. Can you see that? Andrea, is that coming through for you? Yeah, it is. Okay, so this is a hydrothermal vent with all the microbes and animals that live on it. And, you know, so <coughs> if there weren't any critters here, it would just look kind of like that brownish, grayish outside of the vent. But all these, all these beautiful colors, these reds and whites, all these are different kinds of animals, but they live at high pressure. The pressure down here is 4,000 PSI. Well, that's a big number. It's kind of hard to know. It's hard to know exactly what 4,000 PSI means, but look at it this way. When you fill, when your parents fill your bike tire or you fill your bike tire or help them with a car tire, it's about 40 pounds per square inch. So this is a hundred times more pressure than what goes in, in a tire. So we have to make those pressures in order for many, not all, but many of these animals to live. And some of them are amazing. They don't care about pressure at all, but that's a different story. So 
what i'm excited to show you that and also let me show you another hydrothermal vent before we move on um this one is down off the island of fiji in the south pacific and it is <coughs> chemically different than the one i just showed you the one i just showed you is from mexico from the gulf of california so we study different hydrothermal vents to understand the different chemicals and then in turn the different kinds of animals that live off those so back to you andrea thanks pete um so yeah these awesome um high pressure vessels are actually um flow through systems so we can use these really powerful pumps to pump seawater in the pressure vessel and we can measure chemicals in the water as they're going in and then measure them as they come out so we have an idea of what kind of chemical processes are happening in the inside of the high pressure vessel um, the Gerges lab has actually built an entire mobile laboratory filled with these pressure vessels and their pumps and all of the equipment needed to carry out experiments um, in these vessels and with deep sea creatures and microbes and mud um, and chemistry. Yep, let me uh, show you guys a few pictures. Okay, and I'm sorry if it's a little jumbled behind it, but there are the pressure vessels. You see those? They're like the ones Andrea was holding. And um, we have, let me show you the outside. We have built all of this in one of these railroad containers. Now, you, many of you have probably seen this on the backs of trucks, but this is a big refrigerator. And what's cool is that with a big refrigerator, we can build all of this heavy high pressure equipment, whoops, build all of this heavy high pressure equipment and keep it in there. So take a look, this is Jenny. She works with us in the lab and she <coughs> is the one who keeps everything together. But um, we're running experiments at sea. So this thing is kind of like the space station, only for deep sea biology, because we have all the high pressure vessels and all the stuff we need to help them survive. Yeah, those vans are awesome. They're so cool. I think one of the coolest things about them is that they're so easy to transport. So we can get them ready here at Harvard in our lab. We can prepare them and then we can easily transport them on a truck and then they can be carried with a crane and offloaded onto whatever ship that we're gonna have an expedition on. Um, so they're really uh, nice for that reason. Um, Pete, did you have anything else that you wanted to say regarding our uh, mobile laboratory? No, we'll see, we'll see what questions these amazing kids come up with. So I'll uh, turn it back to you. Okay, okay, awesome. So now I'm going to move to show you guys um, a couple of cool critters that we have um, laying around in the lab. So for starters, I have this very cute, let's see if I found the camera, there you go, there you go, an angler fish. And it's laying on its side. So let's see, there you can see the mouth, the eyes, and you can see this super cool appendage that's coming out of its forehead. So these angler fish are found in the deep sea um, and they use the little appendage like a fishing rod. So they move it around to lure their prey, smaller fish and crabs, um, to lure them closer to their mouths. You can see the giant mouths right here. And as soon as the prey is really close to the mouth, they'll open it really big and close it and trap the prey. And if you can tell, they have all of these really sharp teeth, so many of them, and they're pointing towards the inside of the mouth. So when the fish swims in or whatever prey swims in, it can't come out. They are trapped in there for good. Um, so they're really cool because of that. Um, another cool fact about these guys is that the ones that we think about when we think about um, angler fish are all females. So this specimen that I'm holding up right here is a female. The male anglerfish are teeny tiny and they actually swim up to a female and they latch on literally forever. They never let go. They become parasitic. So that means that they latch on and they depend on the female for survival. So they will suck out nutrients off of the female's body. 
And eventually the female will use the sperm from the parasitic male to fertilize her eggs. Good guys, another closer look. To me, it looks like they are surprised and they're mad that they're confused. <laughs> That's so cool, Andrea. Is the, the appendage, the lure, is it have any bioluminescence? Some of them do. Yes, it's a great question. So on the tip of it, so this one looks dark right there, that dark tip. Um, some of them have symbiotic bacteria that actually they harvest and they're able to grow in that tip of the lure um, that are bioluminescent. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have another cute creature that I wanted to show you guys to feature, um, which is this giant isopod. So these giant isopods are like the name implies, they are giants and they can grow up to 14 inches. So these crustaceans are closely related to other marine crustaceans like crabs, shrimp, um, and lobsters. And they are also related to terrestrial crustaceans like the pill bugs or, the, or those roly poly bugs that you can find underneath rock in your garden um, in the soil. You can probably see the resemblance with those. So these guys like to live on the ocean floor um, and they like to burrow in the mud. These um, front legs that they have, they're really pointy and they're actually specialized for walking around in the soft sediment at the bottom of the ocean. And if you take a look at the legs that they have in the bottom half of their bodies, See how they're flat? So those are actually specialized for swimming. So they can use those bottom legs to move them around and swim. Another cool thing that they have going on at the bottom of those flat legs, um, they have their gills down there. So they use those flaps to ventilate um, with water. So they move water past the gills so that they can breathe. Um, another cool thing about these giant isopods is check out the back they're really highly segmented so you can see all of the segments going up and down the back which they basically use as an armor so when they feel threatened they can roll up into a ball um, and they use their armor on the outside to protect their very soft internal organs that are on the inside. Yes. All right. Andre, that's so that's so cool. I, uh, you know, we can all go out into our backyards and we can find those little pill bugs. We can, you know, touch yeah. them and they roll into a little ball. But to see one that is over a huge one. So cool. Absolutely amazing. All right. Well, Andrea, do you have any other specimens or should we get into a little Q&A action? Yeah, I was curious um, about the time. If we have um, any time left, I can walk over to the anaerobic chamber or um, we have artificial hydrothermal vents that we can show you guys um, and let Pete tell you a little bit more about what we're doing here. All right. Well, let's, um, I say we take some questions and then maybe save that for the end. Do kind of a little, a quick little walk around as we're wrapping up. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Perfect. So we've got a great crew here. I see lots of questions coming in the chat already. We've got some great camera classrooms we'll bring in as well. So let's start off here with uh, a question from YouTube. So um, from Wiley Magnets Middle School, they are wondering, uh, is there one chemical that's more prominent than another when you test around the vents? That's a great question. Um, and I think I'm going to yield to Pete for that one. Yeah, it's, it's um, actually hydrogen sulfide. And the reason is the, um, uh, the uh, vent water that we see coming out of the vent is actually seawater that's been chemically converted. And there's a lot of sulfate in seawater. Sulfate is a, 
a different kind of molecule that has sulfur, but the, the vents convert it to sulfide. So yeah, that, that is exactly right. It's a good question. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to visit a couple camera classrooms, and then I have a Kahoot quiz as well queued up. So we're going to do a little interaction break, take a few more questions after that, and then we'll do a little walk around uh, of the lab to wrap things up. So let me bring in some of our camera crew uh, and give them a chance to ask some of their questions here. So Mrs. Erickson's crew is joining us uh, from Madison. They are fourth graders. Let me bring them in front and center. Hey, fourth graders, how are we doing today? Hi. Hey, everyone. All right. Are the creatures in the jar still alive? Like Andrea showed us some creatures. Are they still alive? That's a great question. No, they're not alive. They are preserved so that they won't decompose, but they are no longer alive. Is that a question? That yeah. Was, um, how old are the creatures in the jar? How old are they? Yeah. Well, They've been around since I started in the lab, which wasn't so long ago. So I'm not sure what the collection time of these specimen was. Um, Pete, do you know? Hang on a second. There we go. Um, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry again, folks. There's two answers to that. One is, how old are the animals? And I think that the isopod might be like about 10 years old, okay? I don't really know about the angler, but I'm going to guess 5 to 10. Um, but if you're, the other question is, when did we collect them? And the isopod we collected about 25 years ago. Wow. And it just stays preserved like that. Um, so, <coughs> so that scientists can come in and still study parts of it, right? Some things you can study with live animals, other things you could study with preserved animals. That's uh, all so right. That helps. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. And thanks for those those great questions, fourth graders uh, in Madison. Um, let's see, where should we go now? I'm going to bring in our next group here. Miss L's second graders are hanging out with us. How are we doing, Miss L's crew? Good. Good. All right, who's got a question for us? Is that questions? Trenton? Um, when did the animals like die? When or why? When? When? He's asking when did those animals that you have in the jars die? Well, um, a lot of times when we go out and we collect an animal from the deep sea, we need to collect I'm sorry, folks. Um, we need to collect an animal, um, just one or two, so we can study them at home. All right, uh, let's see. Let's bring in our next camera classroom. We'll grab a question. We've got Miss Ball's crew hanging out with us in Godrich. I'm gonna bring them up on the screen here. Hey, Godrich, how are we doing today? Good. <laughs> so one of the questions we had was um, a little bit of the backstory of maybe Andrea's and Peter's educational background and how they got where they are today. Do you have do you have a specific question or like if Andrea, if you could tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. So you maybe started at some university and then how did you end up being Dr. Andrea Martinez in a lab studying the deep sea? OK, yeah, of course. So my career path is a little bit. It's definitely not linear. Um, so when I first moved to the United States, I actually was trying to be a professional ballet dancer. So my first career choice was ballet. Um, and I was training with the Boston Ballet School for several years. 
Um, and then eventually I realized that it just wasn't my passion. It just wasn't something that I wanted to do anymore. Um, and in high school, I had some really good science classes and I realized that I was really interested in it. I just loved all of my science classes. And so when the time came to go to college, um, I decided that I wanted to major in a science, but I wasn't sure what, what exact major. Um, so I started as broad biology um, major at the University of Hawaii. Um, and my choice to go to University of Hawaii was a lot because the, the climate and weather reminded me a lot about Colombia. So I felt like I was at home there. Um, and I just really loved um, being there. And so I decided I wanted to go to college there. And there is when I discovered marine science um, as an option. And I took oceanography and marine biology classes that were just so incredible. Um, and I was also able to do an undergraduate internship in a lab. And that was the first time that I had contact with science and a research lab. Um, and I really liked it. And in that internship, um, my, my boss gave me more information about careers in science and like what people can do. Um, and so I applied to graduate school. So right out of undergrad, I applied to graduate programs, so like PhD programs. Um, and I ended up in a program at Northeastern University, which is a university here in Boston as well. Um, and I got my PhD in marine biology. Um, and my focus was actually on oysters. So I studied um, oyster microbes and really interested in the different kind of microbes that live on oysters and the possible things that these microbes can do to benefit the oysters. Um, and then when I was getting ready to, to graduate um, with my PhD and finishing my research, um, I started looking for labs where I could work as a postdoc, which is the next step in kind of this academic um, path. Um, and I discovered the Gerges lab and how amazing, like all of the work that the Gerges lab does, um, which involves microbes. So kind of like the central um, aspect of research in the Gerges lab is microbes and my, things that microbes do and how they can change the environment, the environment around them and how can they can mediate these um, different chemical processes. And I'm really interested in that. Um, so, so a lot of the Gerges lab focuses on symbiosis, so animals and their microbes, um, and free living microbes at these hydrothermal vents. And so I was really curious and wanted to learn more. Um, I think the C is completely fascinated, fascinating. Um, and so I applied for the position in Pete's lab. All right, very cool. Well, I want to give a huge shout out because I know Pete uh, is having a rough go today, but it's so great to have him joining us, uh, sharing some of those photos with us and some of his expertise. And we're definitely going to have Pete join us down the road and take us on another deep, uh, deep sea exploration. So Andrea, I think we're going to take a little pause here and I'm going to bring up the Kahoot quiz. We're going to give the, the students a little interactive action. Um, we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll do a little tour to wrap things up today. So uh, I'm going to share a banner here. This is the banner. If you go to kahoot.it, it's going to ask you for a PIN number. And lucky for everyone joining us, I have one of those handy. Uh, and you can use that PIN number to join. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And you should see it now. So the PIN number is uh, 560-9807. You can type that in uh, on the site, or if you have a, a tablet or a phone, you can scan uh, the QR code and that'll bring you in. So we'll give a few moments here, maybe a minute or two. Here come some students already. Excellent. So there's going to be four questions, two multiple choice, two true and false. You've got 20 seconds for each question. If you get the answer right, you get points. If you get the answer right and you do it quickly, you get even more points. If you get the answer wrong, but you do it really fast. Well, we still got nothing for you. You got to get that answer right. Uh, and the faster you do it, the more points you're going to get. So 20 seconds on the clock. I'm going to give maybe 30 seconds. I still see uh, students in classrooms joining. And then we will take things live and we will see who comes out on top on the podium, those coveted top three podium spots.
Um, all right. Still people popping in. Maybe 10 more seconds. All right. Let's take this quiz live. Our first question is loading up. This is going to be a multiple choice question. Pyrite is also known as, is it tin, magma, fool's gold, or lead? So what did we learn? Pyrite found a beautiful color inside of uh, that chimney sample, that hydrothermal vent sample. Five more seconds to get your answer in. All right, Andre, I couldn't fool this crew. Most students went with fool's gold. Very cool. All right, our leaderboard. The prairie unicorn is holding down the lead, but it is close. Let's go to our second question, a true and false this time. High pressure vessels are made of iron. High pressure vessels are made of iron. Is that true or is that false? What did we learn that they were made of today? Ooh, a little closer that time, but uh, false is the correct answer. We learned that the ones in the Gerges lab are made of titanium uh, today. And I imagine, Andrea, titanium is just such a strong metal. It gives them such great strength for that high pressure. Exactly. Yes. All right. Our leaderboard, the Royal Egret, uh, has taken the lead. Let's jump into our next um question we've got another um multiple choice so the angler fish that appendage that lure on their head does it attract a mate does it attract prey does it sense their environment or does it help them fight uh with other angler fish which is that correct answer there all right overwhelming majority went with attract prey and that's pretty cool, uh, Andre, that the females are the big ones and the males are kind of like those tiny little parasites hanging off the bottom. Uh, I bet that's a new, uh, new news to a lot of our students joining us today. The Royal Egret is holding down that top spot. One more question or true and false to take us, take us out. Giant isopods can grow up to 14 inches. Was that true or was that false? We'll never look at those little pill bugs in your backyard the same way again. A couple more seconds. All right, that's absolutely true. Good job, crew. Let's take a look at our deep sea podium. In third place, we've got the inspired macaw. In second, the dynamic crab. And holding down that number one spot the royal egret all right awesome stuff let me come back from that screen share good job crew always great to do a little interaction let's uh jump back into the youtube and see what we have here so andrea mr thomason's crew their class would like to know can octopus live in the deep parts of the ocean can they be in the deep sea that's a really good question um, I believe there's footage of some kind of animal that looks like an octopus, but I'm not sure it's the same species that we think of when we think of coastal, um, you know, animals that we see with their eight legs, their eight arms. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, but probably I, uh, different than the ones that we think of. Yeah, if classrooms have some time today on YouTube, search up uh, Octopus Garden. You might have to, to add Nautilus to that as well. I was on the the ship we're going to visit next uh, a few years ago and we were using ROVs to explore about three kilometers deep and we found a ton uh, of these beautiful purple octopus all turned upside down brooding their eggs it was super cool so we called it the octopus garden you should check it out uh, if you have some time today uh, Miss Dillon's crew in Missouri would like to know have the pressure vessels ever burst or are they just too strong they are really really strong um, so that's one of the first safety concerns when building high pressure 
anything. Um, it's basically like, like a bomb. There's so much pressure in there. Um, so we have to make sure we're using the right equipment um, and the right metals to keep all this pressure hardness so it's safe for everyone to use. Um, so that is a safety um, concern, but we've addressed it and we figured out exactly how we need to run our experiments and build these vessels so that they're safe. Okay. Uh, Miss Moore's crew is hanging out with us. Um, where are they hanging out today? In North Carolina. And they're, they're wondering if you can tell us what's like the weirdest thing you've personally seen uh, in the deep, whether it's maybe through an ROV or maybe a specimen. What's the weirdest thing you've seen? Yeah, that's a great question. So I actually have not had the opportunity to go in a submarine or anything like that. Um, but soon, I really hope I get to do that really soon. Um, but based on videos, honestly, anything you see down there looks like it's from a different planet. Everything, like from these angler fish to this giant um, isopod, it's just everything looks crazy. Um, so I guess everything. <laughs> All right, that's a good answer. It, it's uh, and what's exciting too is that we're just scratching the surface. Uh, I think we've mapped somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to twenty percent of the the ocean floor. There are so many new species left to discover. So any students out there thinking about ocean exploration, it could be a very exciting and very very fun science career. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's get one more in here, and then let's do a tour uh, to wrap things up. Um. Okay, this is kind of a, a fun one here. So your, your day uh, in the lab, what's a typical day look like? So every is there day a typical looks day? different. Yeah, every day looks different depending on what is on top, like what needs to get done. Um, so sometimes there's a lot of computer work. So sometimes I just sit at my desk, at my laptop. Um, and I have to do like data analysis or writing up the results um, of my experiments. Other days I have a lot of lab work to do. So we have a molecular lab space where we can do things like DNA extractions, RNA extractions. Um, so sometimes I'm in there with pipettes and my white lab coat. So sometimes my day is spent in the molecular lab. Um, other days I have to do field work, for example. So um, I'll be out in the ocean or out in the coast. Like I'm currently working with oysters. So I'll go out to the mud flat um, or a salt marsh to collect my oysters. Um, other days I have to tend for the oysters. So I actually bring them back into the lab and keep them alive here to do some experiments with them here. So I have to take care of them. I wash them, I feed them um, and just general oyster husbandry that I have to do. So it really depends on the day, but it's really variable and it keeps things exciting to do different things every day. All right. Very cool. Well, I say we spend our last few minutes together checking out the lab a little bit more. And our, our second graders with Miss L fired me a cool question in the private chat. And I know you won't be able to answer this question for sure with, with an exact number, but they're wondering, are there lots of other labs like the Gerges lab around the U.S. and around the world? Yeah, so to my knowledge, there are. There's a, a good number of people that are really interested in the deep sea. So it, I guess it depends on the university, um, but in, in the, the department, you can find um, different lab groups that are studying the deep sea. All right. Well, Andrea, yes. let's take a little walk around uh, before we wrap up with our students today. All right. Let's see how I can turn this. You should be able camera. to go to the settings and, yeah, and choose camera. And then it should be, you should be able to pick the, the front camera. All righty. Okay. So I am currently go. in our teleconference room um, where we can have these type of meetings. Um, and I'm just going to walk out into the hallway so that everyone can see third floor hallway at Harvard University. All right, so I'm gonna walk you guys down. Um, so here we have some deep sea images. So these are tube worms that live on the hydrothermal vents. This is a picture of a hydrothermal vent, another tube worm, 
some cool snails that are able to live in those vents. Um, here we have a whole space where we keep a bunch of specimen, like the ones I showed you guys. So some of these, this is a tube worm right here, a deep sea crab um, and different kinds of fish. But everything that Pete has collected throughout the years, we keep here in display. Um, and I'm just gonna walk you guys into our lab. All right, so on the left-hand side here, um, we have these high, it's a different kind of high pressure vessel. Um, as you can see, they're down here and they're made um, for sediment. So some folks from the lab are doing experiments where they put sediment here with a bunch of microbes and they can push these um, to the limits of their physiology. So really high pressure and really, really hot, for example, to see what happens to their metabolisms. So we have four of these in the lab. And these are what Pete likes to call our um, synthetic or in-lab hydrothermal vents, um, but they are highly controlled. So we're able to run control experiments. Another cool thing that we have in the lab is this um, anoxic chamber. So in this chamber, you can see is really sealed off with this plastic. Um, and even if we wanna work in there, we have to use these gloves to go on the inside. Um, and what's cool about this is that on the inside, there is no oxygen, zero oxygen in there. Um, so we are able to do experiments with microbes that don't like oxygen. So microbes that can only survive in the absence of oxygen. So we keep those in here. Let's see what else I can show you. Um, so I'm going to show you guys the back of the lab. All right, so I think the signal might have dropped with us at the back of the lab. We'll give a, another moment here and see if Andrea uh, can get to a spot. Build it where here this, from oh, scratch. There we go. So, for instance, those high pressure vessels, they were built here in the lab, in our little uh, lab workshop. See, oh, we have some cool pictures in the hallway of the submarines. Um, and this is the Atlantis with Alvin stuck to it. All right, Andrea, that was so cool. What a, what a great lab. So much gear, so much... Um, uh, you know, equipment, I'm sure a lot of that equipment was kind of developed right in the lab uh, yes. and in that workspace as well. It's, uh, yeah, what a, what a great career. I know being in the field is a lot of fun, but it looks like being in the lab uh, can be pretty rewarding too. Yes, it's also a lot of fun. Um, and you have the space to be really creative in there. All um, right. So I, I just showed you guys um, where I'm able to walk in. Um, which is that space, but we also have a molecular lab space where you have to be a lot more um, sterile. So I would have to put in my white lab coat and so on, but that's more complicated when I'm on the phone. <laughs> gotcha. Well, Andrea, I want to start off with a shout out to all of our classrooms, to our camera classrooms, to our YouTube classrooms, the classrooms will be tuning into the recording today and throughout the week. Thank you so much for being with us and the great questions and playing Kahoot with us. And obviously a huge shout out to Dr. Pete um, and best wishes. We hope he, he feels better soon. We can't wait to host him again. And Andrea, thank you so much for a great event showing us those amazing specimens um, and uh, the tour of the lab. And when you get out uh, onto a ship, maybe we'll have you join us and you can share the experience with us. 
Yes, that would be great. I'm really happy I was able to show you guys some of the cool gadgets and animals here in the Gurgis lab. Um, and I just wanted to mention really quick because I remembered I didn't um, say, so those anaerobic chambers that don't have oxygen, so bacteria that don't like oxygen, they're actually found in the deep sea, in the sediment. So when you start going down the sediment, you reach a point where oxygen no longer reaches and you have all of this anoxic zone down in the sediments and that's where we collect microbes um, that actually die in the presence of oxygen all right very cool well i'm going to share the link one more time here uh if you want to find the events coming up in fact in eight minutes we'll be live on board the exploration vessel nautilus uh, where they're mapping the sea floor around Johnson Atoll in the Pacific. So you don't want to miss that. Stay on our channel and you can check it out. Andrea, again, thank you so much. It was so great to meet you, spend a little time with you today. Uh, and I know our classrooms learned a lot. Great. Thank you so much for your attention, guys. All right. We're going to sign off for now. See you in a bit, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs>